The Lord Christ saith, Wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what does Jesus' dark riddle about children with flutes in the marketplace and coming to him, all ye who are burdened and heavy laden, what do those two things have to do with each other? And the part in between about why is it intelligent, you know, not giving it, and, you know, how does this gospel relate to itself, let alone to anything else? Well, my thoughts were drawn to growing up in San Diego and spending where I spent a lot of my summers and weekends at the beach and on the Pacific Ocean. And a major fixture of the beach scene were the lifeguards. And especially in their sun, summertime when the lifeguards would be out in force and there in the, is the classic days where they'd be up in the towers, you know, and they'd be looking out with their binoculars on the surf or whatever they were looking at in their binoculars on the beach and you know and they were bronze and they were bleached and they had the, the zinc oxide back in the day the zinc oxide on the nose and they had the red trunks and the rescue tubes and boy it was something you could it's almost as if you could create a whole show around life garden <laughs> what a life what a life right it looks so, it's so glamorous right i mean to be paid to sit there sunning yourself but those of us who were the so my friends and i we were surfers and so we were out there on our boards we were out there in the surf and what people didn't see was the preparation and the trials that went into being uh, an ocean lifeguard as opposed to a you know the community pool lifeguard to be an ocean lifeguard there were spring trials i mean you had to try out you know not everybody got to, you know made it because you had to be able to run right into the surf and that water was cold it was a pacific current coming down from alaska right down the coast it was cold water and you had to be in the kind of shape and conditioning for of swimming to be able to swim out to wherever people were and be able to pull them in against an undertow or the current that comes up in the pacific ocean sometimes to just pull people right out to sea people who would be drowning in the surf you had to go out there and get them it wasn't all sunning yourself on the beach right it wasn't life wasn't a party for lifeguards all the time anyway right and even has the even if they made it through the spring trials and their conditioning their life uh, as a lifeguard was punctuated by drills we would sometimes see them they would all go out and and you know run into it's like ooh, are they saving it no they're just doing another drill and they they were ran out there to practice saving people now this was you know has kind of jealous as has you know the guys my age or the high school boys we were all like kind of gangly guys out on surfboards we were jealous of the lifeguards right but the fact is you want a lifeguard with strength and stamina standing watch don't you you don't want a pudgy lifeguard you wouldn't want rob price out there guarding you know like if you it's like you know the family comes up is like oh is that, here's our lifeguard rob price and the family say like oh i'm so glad you have him on the radio right you know but who's the real lifeguard no, he is the real lifeguard. It's like, okay, kids, get back in the car. We're going back to Arizona, right? I mean, that's, you don't want a pudgy lifeguard any more than you want an arthritic neurosurgeon, right? And so discipline and judgment precedes and sustains the mission and the celebration of being a lifeguard. And each life that they saved was a vindication, if you will, of the wisdom of their lifestyle. I think this kind of tries to get at what Jesus is, again, difficult and dark riddle about children in the marketplace playing jigs and dirges on their flutes, and the difference between himself and John the Baptist is pointing towards. That is, the discipline and judgment on the one hand, and the mission and the celebration on the other, that are both a part of following Jesus, both sets of things, discipline and judgment and mission and celebration are both marks of discipleship and, by the way, things that will not be welcomed nor understood by the world, symbolized by the children of the marketplace, but they will reflect the wisdom of love. First, 
judgment, and discipline. For that is what John the Baptist brought with him. Repent, you brood of vipers. It's a tough message to sell. I, you know, we read those lessons where John the Baptist says that in Advent, it's almost Christmas time for Pete's sake. And I always think, oh, you know, Christmas. And here we have you brood of vipers, right? Who told you to repent? Well, it's, the fact is, it's really not as even, a, it's not an easier sell in the middle of July either. It's just a tough message. This repentance, this judgment that John the Baptist brings. So, the, but the shape of the criticism of John the Baptist that Jesus is describing in his riddle, his marketplace riddle, it, it comes, it, it basically it's along these lines. This is what John the Baptist was being criticized for. He came neither eating or drinking and didn't dance when the children in the riddle played their flutes. In a sense, he comes as clearly people, he had to say, I'm not the Messiah because people thought he was. He, in a sense, here he comes into the middle of the wilderness, baptizing people. That was a sign that he was starting a movement. What was the movement's goal? What was its destination? Now, what was he about? If it's, and he's acting kind of messianic out there in the wilderness, baptizing people, telling them that there's one who is coming. Well, what is that about, right? And in a sense, the, the, the people of Israel were waiting for a Messiah to come. And in a sense, they, the party, the, the dancing music is the music of children who are ready to party because the shoe is going to be on the other foot. We are going to give it to those Romans and we're going to love it. We're going to enjoy it. And they remembered all those psalms about how the streams will be red with blood and your dogs will lick your enemy's blood along the side. I mean, they remember those kinds of psalms. Right? It's like, yes. Now those psalms are coming true. This is the party we've been waiting for. A Messiah party. A bloodletting party where we can get our own back against these dirty Roman pagan dogs that are in the middle of our land. And John the Baptist, what are you doing wasting your time with all this judgment? I mean, why are you, you know... The reason why John the Baptist should have been picking on Herod from this line of criticism is because Herod was a tool of the Romans, not because of these peccadillos of Herod's boudoir. You know, that in a sense, but that's what got him in trouble, right? And it's kind of like, John the Baptist, you're wasting your time, right? What are you do, what, why are you doing all this judgment stuff when you need to be leading the movement to accomplish the real justice, which is getting back on those Romans? We're playing, a, we're playing a tune for you, but you're not dancing. We're ready to party, right? Like it's the Jubilee, but you're not bringing it. And the fact is that John was criticized because he wasn't the Messiah, said so clearly. He didn't come to bring the Jubilee, the feast and celebration of Israel's freedom, but rather came to prepare the way for it. And he prepared the way, the way that John was going to prepare was not by making iron weapons. It's not like bring your iron, you know, your plowshares and we'll turn them into swords. That's not what he did. That would be one way to prepare, right? For a revolutionary movement. That would be one means of preparation. By the way, you know, let's, let's get our sins forgiven because we may, you know, in this battle, not all of us are going to make it. So it's kind of like make your confession before we go. So that would be one way to prepare, but that's not what he was up to. Rather, John's means of preparation was a judgment, a judgment that said to all who heard him, stop making peace with the world on its own terms. Right? Stop making peace. That's his judgment. Stop making. We're not going to make peace by making war. Right. We're not going to make, you know, we're not going to create the ideal Israel through violence. That's not what it's about. So he says to the soldiers, we hear from the Gospels, that he says to the soldiers and the tax collectors who, who are in his audience, if you will, he says to the soldiers, stop extorting money from people. And to the tax collectors say, hey, hey how can we get on board with this movement? Well, only take what you're allowed, you know, you should, according to the law. Now, we as modern Americans, we say, hmm, that's very prudent advice, John the Baptist. I mean, that sounds like constitutional law and order, right? I mean, it sounds like, a, you know, where you're getting rid of corruption and, you know, keeping the military in its place. Well done, John the Baptist, right? He might have been an Episcopalian after all, right? You know, good for him. Very prudent. Yes, don't extort people. Well, see, the thing is, 
Telling soldiers in his day not to extort money from people and tax collectors to only take what they had to pass on to Rome would be like telling waiters to work without tips. Right? It's the way the whole system worked. This isn't prudent, moderate constitutional order advice. This is saying stop being a cog in the wheel of the system that is oppressing your brothers. Stop being a part of the system, right? He is giving them advice which would make it impossible for them to be the soldiers and the tax collectors that the system needed them to be. And that's precisely what his judgment was about. It's precisely what he was trying to free them from. The judgment of St. John the Baptist was an invitation to those who came to him to reimagine what they would do and who, would they, who they would be if they weren't a part of an unjust system, right? If you will, what they would do and who would they be if they didn't enjoy the privileges that came from soldiering and tax collecting from God's people. John the Baptist's invitation to accept a life of repentance means that all those in his hearing, soldiers, tax collectors, Pharisees, and all who came to the River Jordan trying to figure out what kind of Messiah John would be, it was an invitation to them. In a sense, it forced them to have to discover a life that was free from the enchantments of privilege and injustice and sin and death. And instead, discover a life that was as dependent on God's power as opposed to human power. And the only way that human power works is through violence, right? As I like to say, when push comes to shove, there's a shove. That's how human power works. And he was a life of repentance and the judgment which woke people up to the possibility that there could be a different kind of life, a different kind of world, right, meant that it was an invitation to embrace a life as dependent on God's power as someone who only ate the grasshoppers that flew into his hand, dipped in the wild honey that served as a symbol that Remembering Samson's story served as a symbol that even the dead lion of Judah was buzzing with a secret of new life as sweet as God's own word of promise. Like honey to the mouth. And that, and that, they would embark on a life that was a wilderness kind of life, a life in the midst of trial. A life of living, uh, or living a life that bore fru the fruit of mercy, justice, and love. That's fruits worthy of repentance. A life of mercy, justice, and love in the midst of barren fig trees. Right? You got to be ready, John the Baptist, you got to be ready to be like a tree laden by, with fruit in the middle of a desert. That's, what, that's, what the, that's the movement I'm preparing you for. That's the disciplines I'm trying to create, trying to instill in you. Disciplines of repentance that bear fruit of mercy, justice, and love. Has the prophets have told you all along God wanted. And that being in the wilderness in this way would enable us to receive the manna, the bread of heaven, that our faithful God would give to us to see us through. To see us through all the way to the land of promise. John the Baptist's ministry, even as it is continued in the church to this day, reminds us that the hour before a dinner party is not the time to be eating and drinking. Right? I mean, when, you, when you're getting ready to have people to your house for the dinner party, the hour before that is not a time to be parting it up. You're working hard. Am I right? I mean, you're, I mean there is no eating and drinking. There is no celebration. It's stressful. It's stressful and it can be stressful to be the church, but the call is urgent because the guest is about to arrive and the house is not ready. And that is the judgment. The house is not ready for his guest and the guests that our guest will bring. The house is not ready. Make straight a path in the wilderness. 
make ready a house. Make it ready. This is the work to be done, the work of righteousness, mercy, justice, and love, which will be mocked by the children of the marketplace because that's not the way their world works or the way they want it to work. It will be mocked by the children of the marketplace and those who celebrate the way the world works and toot their horns loudly enough to drown out the voice calling in the wilderness. But we who stand in his footsteps will not dance to their tune. Rather, the riddle that Jesus tells and what comes after reminds us that it is Jesus who brings the party, not the children of the marketplace. That is, Jesus brings a mission that is celebration. His mission is a celebration. It is, what he points to in his riddle is that the criticism that Jesus was getting, as opposed to what John got, the criticism that Jesus was getting at the time was along the lines of, do you not see and weep for the nation? Don't you see what these filthy Romans are doing to our land and our people. Don't you, don't you care, Jesus? Don't you care? You, you're all this feasting with tax, tax collectors, people like Zacchaeus, right? Hanging out with sinners. We don't need them in our movement. We need, we need soldiers. We don't need sinners. We have soldiers. What are you hanging out with these people for? Don't you care? Don't you weep? Don't you wail for the nation? like a good Messiah should. I mean, if that's who you are, if that's who you are, then why aren't you weeping? See, he, what Jesus points to is that you can't win for lose, right, with the children of the marketplace, right? I mean, you know, either way, they're going to criticize. And that was Jesus, the criticism of Jesus. What are you going to do about these Romans? How are you going to shape up these sinners? Make them into good soldiers of Yahweh. Jesus' answer is to forgive the one and befriend the other. Do you hear that? He is a friend. I love that word. He is a friend. Dare we say ally of tax collectors and sinners? Jesus is not fasting, but feasting. He's behaving as if the war is already won. And that's what's getting a lot of folks mad at him. Like, what are you doing? The war, has, you haven't even started fighting it. And Jesus says, you know, I'm a lover, not a fighter, right? The battle's already been won. This posture is incomprehensible to a world that can only win battles through violence. A world that can only see progress in the shape of domination of one group by another. That's the way the world works. It's incomprehensible to behave as if the war is already won, but this is precisely what Jesus is doing. And so he's a glutton. He's a partier, that party boy from Nazareth, acting as if the Jubilee was already here, as if people are already forgiven. God! But Jesus can behave this way. He can behave this way, beloved, because in the words of Stanley Harawas, the kingdom is not some ideal of peace that requires the use of violence for its realization. Rather, the kingdom is Jesus, the one who has the power to overcome violence through love. The power of suffering love is indeed hidden from the eyes of the wise and intelligent in the marketplace, in the world. is something, though, that powerless people know. It's something that infants know. Infants just seem to have the knack for drawing out love. It's, they just do it. Infants know the power of powerless love. Maybe that's why Jesus would want us to become like one. Those who can rest in their total dependence on God's power know the power of suffering love. Those who are being made new, born again, healed, 
restored, they know that power too. Do you know that power? Are you ready to be an infant of the kingdom rather than a child of the marketplace? Jesus says, come to me, to burdened, spiritually drowning people. He goes into the waters of death to fetch them out. And we continue Jesus's ministry in the church alongside of that of John the Baptist. When we tell burdened, spiritually drowning people that Maybe for the first time in their life, they can breathe easy because they can breathe the spirit of the new creation. And yet, and yet, even celebrations have their disciplines, their yokes, <laughs> the habits that make feasting joyful. After all, the work of the host doesn't stop when the guests arrive, does it? It just changes. And so, yes, you're eating and drinking with your guests. You're having a delightful time, but you're still working. It's a different kind of work. It's a fun kind of work, right? Maybe not as exacting as the hour before the dinner party, but it's still a yoke to be a host. It's still a yoke to feed others. It is the work of friendship and peace. I love that word, friendship, right? Friend of tax collectors and sinners, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. It's the work of friendship and peace. And anybody who's been a friend and anybody who's tried to make peace can tell you that those two things are anything but static or languid pursuits. Right? Being a friend doesn't mean you do nothing. The deeds that vindicate the wisdom of allowing God's judgment to stop the music of the marketplace in our, that is ringing in our ears and wake us from our compromises with injustice and death so that we may bear fruit worthy of repentance. The seeds of love's new creation, an incomprehensible feast for friends and fellow sinners alike. A burden which followers of Jesus bear. However, it is a burden which even newborns can carry because it is as easy and light as breathing, I love you. John the Baptist and Jesus show us that the children of the marketplace will understand neither our disciplines the way we spend our time, the way we sacrifice for each other. They may give us a line on our tax return for some of those disciplines, but that doesn't mean they understand what we're up to. The children of the marketplace will neither understand our disciplines nor our celebrations. After all, what is worship but the waste of a perfectly good Sunday morning? that could be spent sleeping whatever off whatever you did on Saturday night. The children of the marketplace will mock our judgment of their world and our mission to save people that the world thinks, why bother? Why bother? Let them drown. So much flotsam and jetsam. But the wisdom of love is vindicated by her deeds. Amen.